and this is where the game theoretic understanding comes into play is that given all of this antagonism amongst people, especially those that are trait disagreeable. Um, and you could think about this, I guess at an individual level, but it, it clearly it scales up into nation states and other organizations. This drives people towards neutral territory, right? This is one of the ways I've liked to describe gold is that the reason it's been, another reason it's been successful is because it's apolitical. It's a neutral territory to hold gold is to hold an asset that is pure equity and 0% liability. So you're not subjected to the willpower of others. Not, that's not entirely true because it can still be violently confiscated and whatnot. But in a market-based transaction, it's uh, minimized counterparty risk, let's say. Yep. Bitcoin takes that a step further in that it's much harder to steal. Right? It's, it's much more resistant to coercion and violence than gold would be if properly custodied. Um, you could argue that, what's that? Custody, like a hosted wallet. Yeah. It's different than a wallet that you control. And yes. these are sort of the sort of things like people will synonymize paper gold with physical gold, right? Gold in a bank, as opposed to gold in your backyard in a hole. Everything carries different risks. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I think that it, there's something, and this is almost fundamental to what Bitcoin solved is the Byzantine general's problem, right? How do you propagate a message with high fidelity across a network of inherently antagonistic actors? Um, so it's almost like the only, and this is just a way that I framed it in my mind is, okay, the geopolitical response necessary to stop Bitcoin would require propagating a trusted message across inherently antagonistic nation state actors so that they act in a concerted fashion to suppress or destroy Bitcoin. So in other words, they would need to solve the Byzantine generals problem, but the only solution to the Byzantine generals problem is Bitcoin. So the, the, the very antagonism that divides individuals and nation states in the sphere of economics, I think pushes yeah. them into Bitcoin over time. What is build back better? Yeah, the effort to. Why does to do every that? leader that matters seem to say "build back better" as if they thought of it themselves uh, while going to the loo in the morning? Hey, I've got it. Build back better. <laughs> um, I don't think you know what you're up against. Where does this come from? What build back better? Yeah, where does this concerted messaging come from? Japan. Japan. Japanese disaster relief. I think it was a theory that came out of J Japanese. I can't even believe I'm having this conversation. <laughs> Japanese disaster relief, which said, don't just build back what was there before. Take the opportunity to look at what was there, how it got into trouble, and what should have been if it had been built in the present era and build back better. Then somehow the World Economic Forum got a hold of the Great Reset and pushed out to all the Stepford wives who are the prime ministers, presidents, and ministers of various countries. And so they all now act like they've touched a pod, an invasion of the body snatchers, and they just mumble, build back better, <laughs> freaking the rest of us out that uh, somehow the great reset, um, one health and the pandemic situation, somehow they're, are they all related to each other? Uh, Every time somebody says build back, back better, I look over my shoulder. Is, is Jeff Epstein behind there too? I have no idea. <laughs> so It's pretty creepy, don't you think? Oh, extremely. The one that really okay. creeps me out, in 10 years, you'll own nothing and be happy. This is another <laughs> World Economic Forum slogan well, I've I, seen. I know. I just don't think that they're going to own nothing and be happy. Okay. You see, yeah. You want to hear my crazy take on that? This is like really conspiratorial and ridiculous. Maybe Please. I should say the there was a thing in wealth in vogue. Yeah, there was a thing in wealth management that taught the rich to say that that you should make sure that you don't actually have any assets. That way, if you get sued, there's nothing to go after. But if it's in some trust that you somehow direct even though it's irrevocable and it lives somewhere else. 
you know, the idea is you should have no money. You should have no assets. Only a fool should have assets. You should just fly around in planes and, and live in luxury automobiles and do fabulous things with no money. And the formal games that accountants and lawyers come up with to make that possible is weirdly echoed. Oh, we've learned how to get by with nothing through Nevada trusts or some strange relationship to the Cayman Islands or the Shannon airport or something you can't figure out. Mm. Um, why not tell everybody that they should have nothing? <laughs> I worry that they're serious in our case and they're formal in their case. It's for Bitcoiners, we just have boating accidents. <laughs> what? You have we, boating accidents. We just have boating accidents. You haven't heard of this? No, I, I don't. Oh, the big, there's a big meme, memeified joke in Bitcoin that, uh, oh, lost all my private keys in a boating accident. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, just, it's the, same, the same objective is to have no money, no assets, but live a fabulous life. The, the dog um, ate my private keys. Yeah, exactly. You don't yeah. need the formal legalistic games. You just go out on your boat one day and <laughs> have an accident. <laughs> yeah, well, so whatever it is, the World Economic Forum and our nation's leaders and whatever structure is propagating certain things on a different network. Uh, another example of this would be Sinclair Broadcasting. Uh, getting every local affiliate to say exactly the same words uh, yes. in their own voice. This, this is, is extremely dangerous for our democracy. Yes, exactly. That is extremely creepy too. So on the World Economic Forum piece about not owning anything though, this one I find to be a particular specter because property is the basis of peaceful civilization. I, I think... Ayn Rand talked about this, that all human rights really derive from property rights. So the foundation of property rights is just self-ownership. You own yourself, right? And this is based on an a priori truth. Like only I can move my arms. Only you can move your arms. Like we are each individually self-owned. And then by extension, whatever we infuse our self-ownership with in the world, whatever we spend our time creating becomes our property. So when you have now top-down World Economic Forum propaganda contradicting this very basic rationalistic truth that forms the substrate of civilization, I'm worried. I mean, this has the flavor this of a... The, yeah, this is the threat of abundance and of central control. But you have to imagine that if you take my crazy perspective, which is that capitalism and communism are both tied to a period of time mm. and that we outgrew communism first and we're quickly outgrowing capitalism second, as opposed to declaring a winner, that capitalism is the once and forever champion of the universe. Um, Build Back Better has a certain kind of an ominous scent. Now, part of that has to do with um, asset protection that the rich have learned not to own things, but to loan them back to themselves and in very weird ways, enjoy a stream rather than an asset mm. um, because assets are dangerous to hold because of the legal system or the taxation system. Then there's another principle which says it's inefficient to own a stock of something better to own the flow mm. uh, off of it, which is, uh, I own a right to the flow off of the Uber fleet by keeping the Uber or Lyft app, let's say, in my pocket. They own the cars, but the cars are now in use. Or, sorry, that would be a case where the drivers might own the cars. But you can imagine that somebody owns a pool of things and then you're getting the flow off of the pool mm -hmm. and that's good enough. Um, you know, maybe, maybe the idea is that uh, Amazon Web Services owns the data centers, but you're getting the flow of use off of them. And that's really the only thing you needed. Why did you want to actually have a brick and mortar uh, setup in which you actually own servers? Mm -hmm. And so in part, it's mixing together the idea that the rich are going to screw us. You can be like the rich and own nothing like us or technological Pro progress, which is we can own flows and not stocks, or there's the 
why can't we be simpler people and just go to Tulum and uh, sing by a campfire and be happy with that? Whatever it is, I don't know these people and I don't want them running my lives. And most definitely I'm creeped out that they, they behave like an army of robots. Yeah. And, and as if that isn't the creepiest thing in the world to hear Prince Charles and the New Zealand prime minister and our president utter the exact same words. Yes. And Angela Merkel, or maybe the Pope. And now is Oprah going to say that we have to build back better? It's just like, have you ever heard a normal human being turn to you in a, in an intimate moment and say, you know, Robert, I'm really excited to build back better. It's, Nobody talks like this. No. Except robots. I think Boston Dynamics should have an army of atlases and spots that just bark, build back better. <laughs> oh, it's funny, but terrifying at the same time. Um, okay, so maybe I can put this forward to you. It, sure. This idea of holding no assets or owning no stocks, just having the rights to the flow through some, you know, abstraction. Yes, uh, abstract machinations that protect you from the prying hands of politicians and or the legal system. Does this, I mean, th to me, this is symbolic of the demand, which is kind of intuitive for an untouchable asset, right? Everyone wants to own something that no one else can do anything about. That's what gold was, right? Just the, the money with the least counterparty risk. And I think that's what this is another way to frame the value prop of Bitcoin is like, it really is the untouchable asset. Um, when proper precautions specifically around custody are taken, um, it's virtually immune to confiscation. So, so does the increase in government interventionism, clearly governments, a lot of the major governments are quite insolvent at this point. You know, the IRS, I think Biden just hired 80,000 IRS agents. They're trying to increase revenues. You know, the, 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 the taking is going to increase. Is this not in, how can this not drive people at least partially, uh, drive a part of their portfolio's capital allocation into Bitcoin as the ultimate high ground from all of these political To an extent, but then, you know, you, how do you feel about hosted wallets? versus wallets that are, you own yourself? I think multi-sig is the best. Custodianship and, and reporting and all that. Don't answer that, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I'm trying to be real with you guys because I worry that you spend so much time educating stupid people. And by stupid people, I don't mean dumb people, people who are like me, stupid about Bitcoin. Mm. That I worry that you've extrapolated way too much from a few incidents, you know, like a forking issue and Mount Gox and all, all this kind of stuff. Okay. But you haven't seen what's coming. I mean, Bitcoin is a real threat, man. Mm. You're going to be sitting on top of a real threat. And when the sovereigns fully wake up there, it's either going to be too late for them to do anything and they'll get on board, which is your hope. Or they're going to say, wow, did we let this thing get out of hand? It's like what the recording industry of America did under the MP3 wars hmm. and the file sharing networks. Mm -hmm. As you started having some kid getting a letter from the RIA saying, hey, we're going to take your family's assets. Yeah. Like what? <laughs> yeah, I was trading songs out of my bedroom. And suddenly the recording industry of America uh, is threatening my family. Well, yeah. you're going to find out that... Um, you're all flesh and blood. You haven't uploaded yourself under the blockchain. You're not a bunch of silicon. You don't know what's coming. I remember the RIAA incident that was occurring when I was in college to a lot of my friends that had been downloading or trading music in high school or middle school. And then they're getting these letters, you know, five to 10 years later. How did that end up? That was mostly settlement. Right? Then they just they basically extorted people for money, as I recall. It was like, send us five thousand dollars, and this goes away. Um, well, I mean, it really ended up with Spotify and Apple Music. Yes, ultimately, and yes. that ended up 
capitulating in some sense. The artists couldn't really sell music effectively anymore. So yes, Mm -hmm. you can make a small amount of money um, under some circumstances, but you don't have the same kind of payment structure that you had before. And then talk to your friends in the music business. There was a period of time where the claim was the only people able to make really high quality records were people with family money, Mm -hmm. Um, where, you know, mommy and daddy would uh, hire the studio, the producer and the musicians. And then hopefully the kid has some talent and there's some names of famous people who fit that because the arrangements uh, it may be that Apple and Spotify said, Hey, we, we, we found a great business model. Everybody gets paid. Everybody's happy. Well, musicians who don't tour are not happy. Right. So, Touring, so, you can still make some money. Yes. Yes. And that, this gets into the dematerialization conversation we had in Hollywood and the as well. Failure conversation. Yeah. So by drawing on that analogy to the nation state response of Bitcoin, do you think it would be, something like that where they just try to charge you an exit tax or some super tax on your Bitcoin holdings or whatever, you know, just to make it quote unquote, go away. Um, Or, I mean, the other possibility I would think is that again, if nation states are increasingly desperate for revenue, the window on inflation is being closed out by Bitcoin the counter argument there, the the adversarial thinking in Bitcoin is that a lot of nation states will start opening their doors to Bitcoiners. They want capital to come onshore and invest in all of these things. So it would incite more competition amongst uh, jurisdictions. To an extent. I mean, I, I think it's worthwhile looking what happened to Alpine banking. I don't know Alpine banking. Well, Swiss, Swiss relationships, for example, uh, to money were a fabled culture thing that, in essence, Switzerland could be trusted with money in a way that the rest of the world couldn't be. And, yeah. you know, Austria is in the Alps. There are other financial countries in the Alps. Yeah. Alpine economics, in essence, came under a lot of pressure because the U.S. wanted to know, well, who's got these accounts and what's in them and are people using them to evade responsibilities? Um, And you saw some real capitulation, Mm. you know, Switzerland isn't the island that you think it is. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen, but to not worry about that stuff is asinine. You you can't, you, you know, yes, things that have never happened to you yet can happen. Do I believe that violence towards Bitcoiners is the most likely? I don't really know. But I know that this whole fiat planet is got to blow up unless somebody comes up with some new major engines of growth. Yeah. If there isn't a replacement for something like Moore's Law and make maybe like five replacements for Moore's Law, um, I don't think this thing is stable and it's going to lurch around for any way it can to square its circles. Yeah. It, it's going to try violence. It's going to try, um, you know, my personal favorite is I think that six, seven and eight figure families are going to be called the very rich by nine, 10, 11 and 12 figure families. Mm-hmm. And that there's going to be an attempt to get the orthodontists of the world you know, who buy second homes in their 50s um, to stand in for the multi-billionaire class. Um, and then they're going to find out that there aren't enough families of single-digit and double-digit millionaires to go after. Mm. I, I think we're going to try to do all sorts of crazy. We're going to try to MMT our way through things. We're going to try to launch phony wars. We're going to try to decide that uh, Bitcoin is is uh, useful in terror. That's coming for yeah, sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, your friend is a Bitcoiner. How do you know he's not planning to attack? <laughs> um, I, I think we're in a terrible situation in which there's no way to keep this, the plate spinning anymore. 
And I don't know how long the plates will continue to spin before it becomes obvious. Agreed. I think you're, you've hit the nail on the head with, when the economic pie stops growing, which has largely been by virtue of digitization, most recently hydrocarbons before that, that the thing that generates. Yeah. Yeah. It degenerates into a zero sum game very quickly. Um, agree, yeah. That's, it's scary to think about. Hey, everybody. As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. It has been said that insanity is defined by doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And I would put forth that the printing of money or the manipulation of the money supply is in that definition a form of insanity we have repeated intergenerationally as humans. We seem to kind of forget it every few generations. We think that manipulating the money supply will fix economic problems or paper over past bad decisions in one way or another. Uh, disregarding the wisdom of our forebears, which has pointed to time and time again that it's not a good idea to mess, to distort the uh, ruler, if you will. Where we are today, and you do an excellent job in your podcast hitting on this, like something started to break down. We'll say early 1970s, but could have been in or around there. The which you know, a lot of Bitcoiners are saying this is decoupling from the gold standard. The sovereign debt bubble that we're in today, and you said this earlier, where you could identify people in on Wall Street that there's a lot of turnover, so people have not been managing money for a very long time. So there are certain things that haven't necessarily happened to them yet that can still that are actually increasingly likely to happen to them. So I would put forth that we are about to go into this, the next major bubble to collapse. You know, we've been through dot com, we've been through real estate, we've had this COVID liquidity crisis. I think the sovereign debt bubble is the big one that's going to really be the big one, basically. And the property right violations that are going to come in the wake of that. I mean, governments are going to be desperate to just get their hands on any form of wealth that they can. I'm especially concerned for real estate because that's a very uh, unconcealable asset. Is there any way to fix this? This repetitive uh, insanity, as I would call it, where we just think we can keep manipulating the money supply um, to try and, I guess, ostensibly correct market failures or manage the market, but it never seems to work out as intended. Yeah, it seems to me that you'd have to have a culture of people who wanted to go through smaller calamities to avoid larger ones. We've never developed said culture. Mm. You'd have to reward people who ushered in problems, like saying, we don't want a conflagration, so we're going to let forest fires happen every other year. Mm. And that way, we're not going to get a huge accumulation of fuel. Instead, we say, well, is there, is there no one who will save us from these forest fires? So we save ourselves from the forest fires up until the point that the fuel is built up, and then we have something kind of different. Um, 
I don't think there's a way of teaching practically minded people the the lesson of the turkey. Uh, you know, number go up, for example, is a an appeal to a historical trend. Um, most people have the idea that if they've never seen powered flight, powered flight is impossible and the Wright brothers are wasting their time. Mm -hmm. Right up until the point that the Wright brothers fly and then they say, well, everybody knew it was going to happen sooner or later. Mm -hmm. um, mostly what people do is they don't want to appear bad in the eyes of those around them. And so the central planners in general put off disasters for somebody else's watch. Like why have a disaster on my watch when I'm going to retire in six years. All I need to do is stop the disaster from happening right, for six right. years. Yeah. So I, I feel like these are some of the unexplored problems of incentive structures that when incentives are not aligned and are poor, um, people behave exactly as you would expect they would um, because you're asking them, do you wish to punish yourself? And like, no, I'd prefer to print money and have somebody else, um, you know, if we're playing musical chairs, as long as I get a seat, it's you who've got the problem trying to find a way to sit down. And mm -hmm. that's what we just had intergenerationally. So roughly speaking, uh, our generations are following in the wake of people who are very comfortable with printing presses. And keep in mind that whatever we've been doing with all of the playing around, you know, for 50 years, Gold bugs and, and the like have been complaining about the 71 decoupling. But you've had 51, 50 rather years of peace, mm -hmm. relative peace. It's been a little scary, the mm -hmm. collapse of the Soviet bloc. And we've had a lot of border skirmishes and smaller wars. But whatever's been going on has been getting crazier and crazier intellectually, but it's still relatively pleasant out there. Yes, you're not making as much money as you wish in your job that goes nowhere. And maybe you can't see your way to retirement. But um, with the exception of protests in the summer of 2020, it didn't look like societal upheaval. And with the exception of being quarantined and having your life taken away from you, um, it's still f fairly pleasant out there. But this whole thing has stopped cohering intellectually. It's not our lives don't make any sense. Right. And if you think they make sense, I'm more worried about you than if you know that they don't. So I, I think that we are going to print money up until we realize that none of this makes sense. Agreed. Um, and this, I mean, again, it's unlearnable. You think the lesson's unlearnable about printing? Well, you know, I, I'm reminded, I think it was uh, Elie Wiesel said that he thought that after uh, the Holocaust during World War II, that there would never be another Holocaust because the lesson was just too, I mean, the Nazis managed to do everything to make absolute evil look visually like absolute evil. Yes. It's cartoon yeah. evil. I mean, yes. it's just perfect cinematic badness. Yeah. Even that wasn't capable of burning the lesson into people's minds that this is bad. You remember Samantha Power, who was the uh, UN representative of the United States under Obama? I got to know her before uh, her book on genocide really took off and got the attention of Obama. So she was still relatively unknown. She was depressed. She couldn't get anyone to take genocide seriously. She had this idea. Didn't we all agree we would never have another genocide? And yet she couldn't get anyone to commit to the idea that we had agreed that genocide was a bad thing. We would never let it happen again on our watch. I think that there's something really horrible about the human condition where we can't learn things. Hmm. Um, you know, those who can remember the past will not be invited into government so that those who cannot remember the past will be allowed to repeat it. Wow. Powerful um, phrase, actually. So it's not bad for an off the cuff riff. <laughs> oh, no, I, I thought you were quoting somebody. That was good. Um, okay. So this gets to, I mean, the Bitcoiner 
grand vision, I think, is the separation of money and state for, I mean, largely the quote you just put forth. It's like, okay, if only those that are ignoring the past can get into the position of government, then that would be something that's detrimental to our learning collectively over time. So wouldn't it be incumbent upon us to disempower that institution to the greatest degree possible? Um, and to your point, your earlier point, I, the past 50 years have been peaceful, but I think again, if I'm, if I'm leaning on a concept I got from Taleb, dampening short run volatility is just going to delay and exacerbate long run volatility. The great moderation was a trial run for what we are experimenting with. Yeah. So in the, the analogy of the forest fires, we have a lot less small forest fires, but we eventually have the big conflagration that burns away the topsoil and prevents anything from being able to grow. So is that what's looming over us now? Is this economic I, look, conflagration? I, I don't know how to get you guys' attention. It's like I say it all the time. I think it's really important to make this planet as habitable and as pleasant and as safe as we can for as long as we can. If your plan is that humanity is to stay here locked on this surface forever, you're out of your effing mind. It's time to go. I don't, because we don't have a car waiting for us to take us off planet mm. because we have some physics that says it's not going to be that easy, which is, it's all real. Our imaginations are so dull that we're not even contemplating saving ourselves. I feel like Elon is at least three quarters contemplating how to save us, mm -hmm. but he's still thinking about rockets and Mars. My great hope, and I, I can't pester you guys because you won't hear it. You just hear it as, but put some of the money into a long range Hail Mary plan for humanity because this thing is not you you can say all you want about hard money fit fix the money fix the world bitcoin fixes this bitcoin fixes everything i didn't say bitcoin fixes everything that's not what i meant okay. mm -hmm. it's not going to work you're, you're going to need institutions you can fantasize that you've gone post-sovereign you don't understand man we're just going to have roads on the blockchain we're going to get married on the blockchain we're going to have babies on the stop no we're not we're going to need institutions. You're going to breathe the air. You're going to be part of physical reality. The nukes haven't gone away. We're probably dealing with our own bio-warfare strategy run amok, depriving us of our lives. And our, my children have lost like you know 10% of their childhood to this nonsense. I don't know how to get anybody's attention. None of you guys really want to do something new. And I'm disappointed, but I'm going to continue to try to get us off planet. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to figure out, is there a physics way of spreading out? Because quite honestly, I don't want to be on the same planet as Anthony Fauci, Nancy Pelosi, Donald Trump, Mitch McConnell, Peter Daszak. I, I can't be here with these people who make no sense, who are endangering us all, who take no questions from any normal human being. We have no hearings. We have no oversight. We have no understanding of what these people are doing. They're not that great. These are not the elite. You can call them the elite all you want. It doesn't turn them into the elite. Right. They're sitting in elite chairs in, in the same way that a baboon sits down in an elite chair. It doesn't mean that, you know, suddenly that baboon is the CEO of Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. I, I hear you loud and clear. Uh, I do want to do something about it. I don't know exactly what to do about it. Um, in my current view, you know, the entire profession of politics, professional politicians, that entire organizational layer of humanity is premised on the violation of property. I understand that. The viability of property. So those institutional forms, I agree with you, we're going to have institutions. It's we have to collectively organize. Okay. We have to put ourselves under some ideological canopy and coordinate. But I think the, if you just have a separation of money and state, or you have inviolable property, which I think Bitcoin represents mm -hmm. in many ways, or at least the greatest implementation towards that ideal we've had since the Magna Carta, um, 
that changes the nature of all the institutions downstream from the money or the property. Right. So in my mind, the greatest way to make this planet habitable as long as possible is to honor this core okay. indisputable reality of self-ownership and its extension private property. Property rights, the genius of the market, hard money, give people an opportunity not to have inflated away that which they've worked and slaved to build up, et cetera, et cetera. Assume that I've got that. Let, let me make a couple of other suggestions. I am not a physicist. Go fund the physics community. Go liberate the physics community with all that sweet FU money that you guys are sitting on top of and give other people the ability to say FU if you're not going to do it properly. Mm. The right way to say FU is just the way Elon came up with a sort of semi-private space agency. We can get into how the government interacts with that. I don't want to dwell on it. We need to decouple our physics. And physics is the only thing with the power to get us diversity of experience. Mm -hmm. If we're going to run different experiments, imagine you have a planet dedicated to Austrian economics. You've got another planet that's dedicated to Keynesianism. Mm -hmm. So people can elect, I, I want to live in an Austrian planet. No, I want to live in a Keynesian planet. Mm -hmm. Great. What a divorce that would be. <laughs> You could run isolated I, economic experiments in that case. Well, that's the thing. This is why I'm so focused on the island of St. Helena in the South yeah, Atlantic, right. because it didn't go through the COVID situation as the rest of the world. It's 4,000, 5,000 people on an island yeah. that has a miniature version of the world there. It's got one town. And in general, every other nation on earth or you know territory had to wrestle with COVID. It got into North Korea. It got into Uganda. It got into Uruguay. And I don't want to be on a planet with people whose decision-making and the ability to insulate themselves, their decision-making is piss poor. They, they're highly extractive. So they're destroying everything that the rest of us have built. They're untouchable. Our media protects them morning, noon, and night. Um, we can't even get people to take an interest in a probably state-sponsored pedophile working for the intelligence services of some country. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe the U.S. Whatever it is that we're doing, many of us need to be away from the, the elite. Mm -hmm. These elite are not elite. They're going to blow this place sky high. They are playing with toys that they don't understand. They don't program their computers. They don't know atomic physics. They don't understand Austrian economics for the most part. They understand how to manipulate things into their pockets. They're very good at that. Those people are going to blow up. And I promise you, with certainty approaching 1.0, the art of the possible crowd, which is what Washington, D.C. sees itself as being, together with the academic world, which has gone ideologically off the deep end, together with our media, that is staffed by people who came out of the academic world that has already gone off of the deep end. There's nothing institutional to trust. If you guys are as rich as I think you are, and I pray to God you are, and I hope Satoshi's listening, for God's sakes, spend money on immunizing things that you love. If you love something in this world, if you see something that used to be great that now sucks, and you've got so much money that you're taking stupid photos and posting them on Instagram and saying, look, Bitcoin really matters. Consider taking that money and giving somebody else other than you the ability to say F you. Think of it as middle finger money. And think about every time you insulate somebody, what you're doing is you're giving that person the ability to cause more problems for the central bankers for the epidemiologists and virologists who can't get anything right on this disease, for the, the, you want to call to task the people who pulled out of Afghanistan in such a God awful way that we sent a message that the US cannot be relied upon. Mm. If, what is wrong with you people? It's so sort of, I mean, I don't know how to say it. It's like, yes, you've got a Lambo, I got it. I'm so effing bored with your photos. You know, super happy about the wealth. Are you building an accelerator? Are you saving an academic discipline from oblivion? Are you saving 
I don't know, form, form a mercenary company to do ethical military maneuvers for the U.S. Do something that insulates our ability to kick ass, be good, give correct answers. I mean, wouldn't it be great, for example, if you had a different copy of the Bureau of Labor Statistics that was empowered to calculate inflation accurately? Mm. I can promise you that the economics profession is holding itself back so that it has the freedom to calibrate the price and quantity indices to report what people need it to say. Mm -hmm. And I guess the way I look at your money is you've got a ton of money that is necessary to feel comfortable about your world, to take big bets. But then there's like your consumption money. So, you know, you imagine, hey, I chartered a, a flight and I took all my friend to St. Bart's and, you know, okay, that's great. At what point do you try to transfer f -uness? Think about the disagreeability of your community. Well, there are virologists who want to say f -u who can't. Mm. There are economists who want to say f -u who can't. There are physicists who want to say f -u who can't. There are artists who are being forced to make bad movies and bad music that reflects some sort of brain dead social engineering mindset who want to go into the studio and make great art. I guess what I'm thinking of is we don't need a redistribution of wealth. We need a redistribution of FU money from the people who've focused on accumulating it to the people who need it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, maybe it's like a flaw in my character, but I, I don't, I'm not that worried about everyone else. I really believe that if you get, if you save academic freedom, if you have a bunch of academicians who are calling out what's going on in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, as opposed to just sitting there like fools, um, forced to parrot things that they've been told if they want their grants from them. It, maybe this is, and this is really isn't about the Bitcoin community. I think I've gotten frustrated with the very rich. The very rich at the moment don't want to build. They don't want to build new universities. They don't want to build new political parties. They don't want to build new outfits that really report. They, they don't believe that it's possible to do anything. And I think what they're learning is that it was very expensive to ensure academic freedom so that respected members of our world had the ability to say things that were scary. Think about Martha Stewart going to jail. Mm. It's so unusual that anyone in Martha Stewart's class goes to jail anymore. It used to be that members of Congress would go to jail with some frequency and financiers would go to jail with some frequency. Um, right now we have a world in which everyone is scared, but some people are rich. And I really think that the best use of a lot of this money, if you wanted to save the planet and you may not, it's not incumbent upon you to save the planet, but the, the role of government is being abdicated. The role of the universities is being abdicated. The role of the political parties is being abdicated. No one can afford the courage needed to do the right thing. And it may be that if, if people have made vast amounts of money, they, they have an idea of, hey, why should I do anything? In which case, good luck. <laughs> Enjoy your planet. See how long it lasts. Uh, I <sighs> Excellent points there. Um, the big thing that jumps out to me is you can't be passive or neutral, right? Even if you've got a few money of whatever variety, billionaire, a ton of Bitcoin, the money is useless if there's not social cooperation and a division of labor, right? If there's not wealth being produced and everything breaks down, your money is just worth less and less over time. So Okay, you make this point, can't live on the same planet with Nancy Pelosi and all of these other politicians that are very extractive. In, in the anti-reality club that is extracting, yeah. The anti-reality club, which I would call it the fiat reality club, right? They're just- oh, Make your own Make your own reality. Yeah, it's, it's 
yeah, literally made up, decreed into reality based on theft via inflation, taxation. I don't want to I don't want to say all these words. It's possible to have a Keynesian system that doesn't fall prey to this. I don't think we're there now. You and I are largely in agreement. You can say it in a more libertarian fashion. I come from a more progressive background, but yeah. right at the moment, these people can't be trusted with these levers. Right. So in my mind, I hear you about getting off the planet. I think that would be kind of the stretch goal because who knows how we're going to do that at this point. Um, Actually, I want to stop because that intuition is killing us. We didn't have powered flight in 1902. Mm -hmm. We dropped a fusion bomb from a plane in 1952. Hmm. 1952 is thousands and thousands and thousands of years after 1902. Yeah. Look at pictures. I don't know when we did Cassini Huygens when we got to Titan, but I believe, you know, it's like inside of a century. Yeah. I don't know that we aren't very close to being able to not only get off this planet, but do quite a bit more. And our pessimism has to do with the fact that we haven't seen the world truly shift. Mm. If I were you, look, I'm the only person saying this, so I don't really know whether I've gone off the deep end and everybody else is sane, but personally, I think everybody else is crazy and I'm just fine. <laughs> Fund your physicists. They're the only people who can get you out of here. And even then it's not a slam dunk. And if you don't want to fund your physicists, fine but know why it is that you're trapped here. It's because you didn't have the imagination to, ima to just fantasize that the theory that does to Einstein what Einstein does to Newton might have all sorts of new gadgets, might have new opportunities. Think about what the semiconductor, which came out of physics did. Think about what the electromagnetic spectrum, which came out of physics did. Think yeah. about what electron levels uh, in chemistry did with the ability to engineer molecules. Think about what the World Wide Web did coming out of CERN. Are you out of your minds? Wait, uh, I'm so bored of this. I can't, I, I go on so many shows, I say the same thing and people just like, dude, you're special pleading. Well, for fuck's sake. Yeah, there's a ton of academic PhDs who went into this field not thinking they were taking a vow of poverty, who thought they were going to get a chance to say F you, work on the coolest stuff and make everybody's dreams come true. And you yeah. know what you did? You flooded their market. You made their lives miserable. You took away their ability to use the intellectual property laws to get any return from what they themselves can do. You signed them over into virtual surf, serfdom and servitude. And now you're saying like, oh, well, we can't have anything new. Well, yeah, because you hobbled your smartest people, you fucking morons. Right. Okay. Sorry. No, it, no, this makes, this, I, I'm, I'm reminded again here of what you said earlier, where we can't see or sense what hasn't happened yet. So we can have these very fundamental breakthroughs very suddenly, right? We could, if we funded physics properly um, and nurtured it, that well, we could have an interdimensional gateway breakthrough. Maybe. Type. Something maybe like maybe you could have dark chemistry. Yeah. You could have an entire industry that would be based on dark chemistry if the dark matter turns out to be accessible in, yeah. in, in an important fashion. But instead, you've got people maybe like Nima Arkani Hamed, one of the most brilliant men on the planet, fantasizing about whether China will build him an accelerator. Mm. Why? Because, oh, it might cost a few billion dollars to build an accelerator. Well, for God's sakes... I don't know. I, I see myself on a Titanic where the idea is that the only people who could actually keep the ship from sinking, you know, are being tipped and paid minimum wage. And, yeah. and, and it's just like, well, do you want to, do you want the ship to sink? It's like, well, you're just trying to get money out of the rich people on board. It's like, sometimes I just want the boat to go under and, and, and it's not a healthy thought. It's just like, right. I'm so tired of listening to wealthy, stupid people. You know, if, if you're so rich, why aren't you smart is a much better question than the reverse. Yeah, I think it, 
I mean, there may be a deeper frustration here with the incentive scheme that the rich inhabit, right? That a lot of people get rich right now through coercion, like we just mentioned about this political class. So I will retract the statement that I said that it's a stretch goal. What are we going to do in the meanwhile? Let's say that they're both goals worth pursuing. It might be a stretch goal. Yeah. And it might be that it's much and it might not be. Yes. Just, you might be on the verge of inventing the, the semiconductor and the computer. Right. And you don't know how much is about to change. Yes. So I would say that the two propositions I'm saying here is there's one. Well, actually, you're putting this forward. I'm just echoing it back. We should keep trying to push innovation, funding the sciences, physics specifically, to have to have these breakthroughs that can be very transformational for human society in the longer arc of history. And then also the the more of the position I think I'm putting forth here is that this political parasitic class that survives through extraction and centralizes power in the world and uh, propagates this insanity even of, you know, printing money to try and fix problems or centrally plan and manage economies, which we've just seen. I don't want to say the market is perfect because we haven't got into market failures yet. I'm still trying to explore that, but I will assert that it is superior to top-down, centrally planned uh, economic models, in my opinion. If we have, if we can advocate for and educate people about untouchable property or inviolable property in its in its best implementation yet, which is Bitcoin, I think we can disempower that extractive class. Okay. So I do, th- so I do think there's a grassroots an idea. here too. Okay, so I've been telling you, Physics, 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 go after physics, only physics, physics, physics. Yeah. Assume that you're not ready for that. All right. Get a bunch of the richest Bitcoiners together and endow three to four chairs in economics at leading universities and say that you want to specify the initial holders of the chair or you're not playing ball. So right now you've got like a professional wrestling association that dominates economic theory. Mm. And you say, look, we just want to bring some MMA fighters in amongst you. You can (laughs) professional wrestle and these guys will MMA and you'll be in the same department. It'll be great. I like this. (laughs) And they're saying like, "Um, well, couldn't we just have the money to hire more professional wrestlers? Like, oh, no, 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 no. The initial chair holder is specified. Person's got good credentials. They come from good places. Again, you know, I'm not an economist. I'm not a physicist. If you do that, you will have so much leverage because a single voice in the Chicago and MIT and Harvard economics departments and throw in Stanford, that's four endowed chairs. You'll have four voices that will electrify everyone because nobody's ever seen the rock uh, go down. Yeah. They've never seen the un- undertaker take a fall because somebody really knows their Brazilian jiu-jitsu. What you need to do is to screw up the performative world by giving the people who need, F- look, not everybody thinks about money as much as the Bitcoin community. And by the way, I want to be very clear. It's not your job to do this. It's not Bitcoin's job to solve all of the problems. It is Bitcoin's opportunity. It's a smart group of people who want to screw things up and have a blast. And I promise you that after you're done jet skiing, after you're done hella skiing, after you've done all forms of whatever it is that you're going to do, you know, wind kite surfing, don't you want war stories? Don't you want, like, you know, I, I work for a guy who decided he didn't want to be bullied by Gawker media for being gay. And I think he spent, you know, several million in order to take down an organization that he felt was harassing. him. Okay. Are are you guys not do it collectively, get a thousand, the richest, most badass Bitcoiners together, kick in a small amount in your own chosen field of economics and pay for the professors who will make everyone else look like idiots. Can you imagine, for example, if you had a virologist right now 
who wasn't dependent on NIH or Anthony Fauci for grants, what they would sound like. Right. Every, you know, think about the Upton, Upton Sinclair line, which is that uh, it is difficult for a man to understand something when his paycheck uh, rests upon, uh, upon his not understanding. Yes. Well, that has led to universal enslavement. Right. Figure out who you want to immunize from that and who you want on team uh, disintermediation. And you can pay for a small amount of freedom. Use the leverage. Figure out the fields where there are people who need to be empowered to say F you and put them in positions of respectability and then watch what happens. Can you endow a reporter's chair? Somebody who will report the news? At what point do you realize how much power you actually have? That's the question. You guys still act as if you don't. It's like you don't really believe in yourself. And that's tough on me. So inherent to this argument, which I think is a very yeah. strong one, the institutions are salvageable in your view. Yeah, they're getting less salvage. They'll be less salvageable two years from now. They'll be yeah. less salvageable than that five years from now. Yeah. But if you look at it, look at the number of voice, you know, Jordan Peterson, for example, was employed as a professor. Mm. Of course, they'd want to get rid of him now. Mm-hmm. Noam Chomsky, in a very different vein, was employed as a professor. There was a mm-hmm. guy named Serge Lang at Yale. The system used to work, mm-hmm. but because we had 5 to 10% of the chairs inside of the institution held by actual human beings rather than Stepford wives. Mm-hmm. If you put 10%, 5 to 10% of these people in immunized situations, and by the way, this could be anyone. It doesn't have to fall to the Bitcoiners. It could be, but you know, so far as I know, Gates isn't doing this. Bezos isn't going to be doing this. Mark Cuban isn't going to be doing this. The rich are exhausted. The standard rich are fundamentally exhausted. They're trying to figure out where they can park their wealth. Mm-hmm. The Bitcoiners have a bit of a different mentality. It's hot, it's it's more disagreeable than even regular wealth. Love that. I, this is. I mean, brilliant perspective, plan of attack, idea. I think this will resonate with with Bitcoiners. Mm.